Okay, welcome everybody to the stream. Gonna get into it today as per usual. We're gonna do some warm up exercises and we're going to get into some fun illustration uh, based on that. Again, just to make sure that we are, um, you know, there's, there's some reason why we're doing the, uh, the, the practice work, okay? So let us hop into it here. So I'm going to be using uh, our virtual pose um, uh, setup. You can go to virtual pose and they have uh, some really good uh, models, some figure drawing uh, that you can look at. Um, and uh, of course it costs money. Um, for the students, it'll be something that we're going to be offering in the future uh, as part of the um, as part of the teaching package. So, be pretty fun to look at that. I'm going to keep it off screen for now, just because of certain streaming rules and different platforms. Um, what I would su suggest for you is to find some figure drawing and and follow along with us. Um, I'm going to probably let's hook up maybe a uh, let's start some music here. Um, a half an hour maybe of a warm-up and then we'll hop into to something where we're going to maybe create a little bit of an illustration with that so um, welcome 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 yep safe weekend I did hope you did as well so we're just going to start a new layer here I'm just going to start a few new layers because I don't like to accidentally paint on my background and uh, let's go find a brush that will be good for us and maybe look for something that's uh fun to to kind of move through strokes this one's a little bit a little bit strange maybe maybe we'll go with something that's a little bit more like a some of us are really weird sampling very strange so or maybe uh that one's not bad i like that one so let us get to it so i'm gonna have my model up here let's go find that there we go i am just going to turn down headphones a bit so I don't hear that crazy music popping off so I got a model kind of sitting there on the stool when you just to reiterate it I think this is something that's handy to mention every time um, you want to keep your first practice sketches really quick right you don't again want to start getting gripped by detail or anything because it's it's not it's not good for warming up to do that because you can start to kind of get into the details and get all sentimental about the kind of artwork you're producing um so you know just keep that in mind um as you're producing the work i think you're gonna have an easier time of it um like that uh like a warm-up exercise um I'm not sure what your question is there, but yes, we're doing the warm up exercises here. So, uh, nice thing about the virtual pose is you can actually turn the model, which is really great. Um, see, you can get a kind of a sense of, of how they're sitting in different uh, camera angles, right? So, we'll get this, uh, this model in there. It's good to, uh, this model sitting on a stool, I mean, 
not the most exciting thing to draw furniture, but uh, we're also kind of just looking at the um, the forms, right? The volumes, not necessarily again being um, sentimental about uh, what it is we're drawing, right? Just get some nice hair in there. Let's turn the model again. Open the back side. You'll really notice, uh, I probably mentioned this before by now, but you really notice the uh, um, your arm getting a little bit tired uh, as you as you paint. If you haven't done a lot, uh, because you're engaging, you know, that whole group of muscles. Um, it's always good to get up and stretch after a session of drawing um, because of that, right? Because we're it can be a physical job. It can be a job uh, or a task, I guess I should say, that is um, debilitating for some if you never get up and get out of your chair, right? I think there's a few people I've worked with that have, you know, had migraine problems and that kind of thing because the, uh, you know, especially if you're working late hours, it can sometimes be difficult to exercise as much as you'd like. Um, and if you're stuck in this kind of drawing position, noodling away and not moving a full range of motion even it can start to kind of freeze things up for you which is not super comfortable in in that regard so things to think about get that stool in there again and we're thinking about drawing these ellipses That's a good one. We'll turn the model again. Even with these, this model is a full body model, so we can sometimes uh, focus on certain areas. You can always zoom in on the model. Um, I might do that here. I'm going to start drawing the hand a little bit as it's wrapped around uh, the bar. So let's grab a layer. Kind of zooming in on that bar. Just seeing that hand kind of move up over top. Seeing those fingers kind of peek around. Subtle, but definitely good to practice, especially, you know, if you're drawing a lot of characters, they're holding weapons and that kind of thing. Um, it can be good to, to know kind of what the fingers look like. Her leg kind of comes up and over and almost like sags over that bar, right? And then uh, drops down below on that side. And we've got the strut of the bar here. A little bit of a weld, that kind of thing. Right, you see that highlight of that bar. I can think about the contours even of the leg. You know, I'm 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 warming up. I don't need to be drawing the the perfect sort of uh drawing or like a, a the verisimilitude doesn't need to be kind of heightened or anything like that because I'm I'm really just trying to figure out those forms and you know warming up the arm all of this stuff so it's just really good practice to kind of think about maybe what the the leg forms the wrist forms uh even the hand the palm that kind of thing as they they move around that shape right so that's her grip in the bar <clears throat> It would kill my right shoulder when standing for hours uh, in a life drawing session. Yep, that's where you gotta take breaks. It's like any repetitive injury you might get is that you're not taking enough breaks. Um, okay, let's uh, let's move the model again. Let's zoom back out. We got a nice picture of the feet and the hands on the other side. Let's get a little bit closer again. Oh. 
question and thinking about those shapes in the foot. So the foot's kind of climbing up over the bar, kind of get those toes in there. It's a little bit harder to do um, in a stream, for instance, but when we're talking about life drawing, it's not always uh, about just drawing figures, right? It can be about getting in there and, and playing with, uh, well, getting out there, really, and playing with uh, some environment stuff. So, But that would require that you leave your computer, right? Uh, maybe engage in a sketchbook, um, which uh, is maybe a bit of a tall order for some people. Um, a because maybe it's just easier for them to be drawing in their studios or whatnot but uh, you know getting out there into the world and actually seeing sort of <clears throat> how you know what a what an environmental space like buildings or or a park you know what that stuff might look like <clears throat> so that uh, you're not just always practicing character stuff so I, I feel like even with if say you're somebody that wants to focus a lot on uh, character work, I would say it's beneficial for you to still go out and, and look at different structures just for the volume practice. Right. Um, certainly, if you're into environment work, then that's a, a really good call to um, to be to be practicing that stuff. So get that toenail in there, a little bit of a little bit of details. Not being too kind of beholden. Well, another way we, we talked about before is holding your pencil or your stylus at the end of it. All right. So that can be a nice way of kind of creating these looser strokes and, and really restricting this because the closer you get to that pen tip, the more you can want to just start noodling detail. Right. So be, be conscious of that. Um, have I drawn a model? laying down pose um, <laughs> I've drawn so many models in my life that uh, I've drawn everything I'm pretty sure so if you haven't get in there I mean life drawing atelier is gonna be better for that kind of stuff um, because you can see the model you can get up you can move around um, personally that's why I like the uh, virtual pose stuff because you can move the model right not only because you want maybe different views but you can see what that arm looks like say if the one picture has a an awkward sort of l flat light on it or something um you can move that around and see sort of what that volume looks like uh without the st stereoscopic vision of course that we have when we're sitting in the studio so move on to another one there So we got this model. She's sitting on a one of those inflatable one of the yoga balls. I don't know. shoulder into the rib cage thinking about these structural forms something uh, something that I do mention to my students is to try and break yourself from drawing from the habit of only understanding the body through you know symbols um, graphic representations of the exterior shape all the time it can be good to know how to draw a leg or a hand if you've got a symbol in mind that it, it makes up most of the time um, but the problem with that, especially for novice artists, is that uh, if you don't ever understand what's lying underneath and, and how that stuff works, then you can start to kind of shortchange yourself a little bit with, uh, with really kind of understanding how those things work. So let's get that leg up there. This other leg kind of traveling down this way. Get that ball maybe moving down here a little bit. 
little bit more. Let's move her around. And I'll hold this. I'm going to zoom into my canvas a little bit just so I can use more of my Cintiq screen. And hold my pen at the end. And really kind of get gestural with it, right? Think about maybe just attacking some of those points and just getting maybe the, the, um, the force of, of those shapes kind of traveling down, being really, uh, that heads a little bit further back here. Just, you know, this, this can actually be quite fun to do because we're not trying to achieve that believable look necessarily. We're trying to get just a basic sense of how things are working in there. That uh, ball shape. Curvilinear forms tend to be a little bit easier when you're using your, your shoulder, I find. Um, just because it's you know you're not kind of engaging a group of muscles um, making it more complex you can kind of just get into one muscle group um, let's uh, calm down the music just kind of flow through there a little bit more just to kind of get in a sense of her uh, Sorry, keep changing the music, gang. It's a, it's Monday. <laughs> I don't necessarily want to listen to Poppy EDM. Um, let's check out some of the. Uh, Could you guys please make a webinar on uh, effects? Um, I think that's uh, definitely in the pipeline. So I'd, I'd watch out for that um, for Houdini. Yeah, good question. Uh, would you do these kind of quick warm up exercises for environments to improve upon environment concept art? Uh, of course, anything, right? I mean, that's the whole point of, of warming up, so. Hello, welcome, welcome, welcome. That is the point of warming up. Just gotta change the uh, the scale. Welcome from Facebook land. We're broadcasting across a few different platforms here, so it's good to see people coming in. Um, all right, let's get on to a different model here. So again, if you're coming in late, I'm using virtual pose. Um, as a method to see some models in the round. Check it out if you're interested. Or, I mean, there's plenty of, uh, of reference online if, uh, um, if you're hard up for a reference. Let's pick a male figure here. He's gonna be kind of sitting in the ground. Okay, we got homeboy, just really nice kind of sweep up into the body there. Head. Um, a really fun way to keep your marks a little bit uh, 
and this is traditional media of course so not not so much on a Cintiq or computer but some of your marks uh, more kind of loose or uneven kind of you know just sketchier uh, India ink you know, something I did in art school was India ink with uh, just go and get a tree branch from outside a small one don't be I mean you could draw with a massive branch but maybe just a smaller branch um, but uh, dip it into the India ink and then I mean you're gonna make a mess so don't do this in your house or apartment especially if you have people you live with that aren't gonna necessarily be as uh, amused by your art skills uh, as the mess you've made um, you know, use use your judgment there but uh, it's a really good way to, to kind of you know just like the cut the quality brush that I'm working with here and, you know it'll too much of that it'll spatter and 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 sort of drip down the page it can actually be quite quite beautiful to look at um, in more of an abstract way right so um, move this guy around let's see if we can get some really interesting other angles for him let's get a little bit closer again let's see if I'm gonna do some blind contour from a, from some weeks ago where we, we played with that well wow. this is more of just like uh, continuous line contour not blind Where I'm not lifting the brush. I'm trying to kind of mask some of those shapes in there, some of the muscles. This guy's athletic looking, muscular. zoom in on his face a little bit here do I miss doing art with traditional mediums uh, yeah I absolutely do uh, it just it tends to be a bit more messy um, right so you just you can't um, you can't be just having kind of like if, if you're sculpting soapstone and grinders and you know power tools or um, clay even you know you you're working away on clay in your apartment if you have carpet or even you know wood floors or linoleum you know those little bits of clay they fall off and they roll and they dry and you step on it and scratch the floor or rub it into the carpet right so even with something like super sculpt is really bad because uh, you know you get that in the carpet and you just it's it's, it's not fun to clean up for sure um, so yeah um, but it, it's like if you had an off uh, uh, say a commercial space or you had the opportunity to go and do those things at a atelier you know that would be great um, so uh, yeah I do miss it for sure um, just for me it if, if any of the rest of you live in kind of condos again with other people it can be difficult to actually um, just you know have that stuff around and keep it safe right I mean I have a whole bunch of oil paints that I'm storing um, just because it's it's a lot of room uh, for that stuff so yeah it's uh, if you can do it then great I get into it it's really nice for me um, if and when I do get to do that stuff, just to switch it up from being at a computer all the time. So, yeah. Uh, hi there. Uh, why isn't the school accredited? Um, as it's a an online school, it can be difficult to get accreditations in every single um, region. And uh, there's some there's some other region uh, reasons for that. Uh, you can definitely contact the school um, for more information on that if if you're more curious about the details on that. Um, I'm not as much the person to talk about that. 
Have you ever experimented with Polaroid or film photography? Uh, I've not experimented uh, with it. I've done it um, in, in university fine arts. I was in photography for a couple of years back when film cameras were the thing and not digital cameras. Digital cameras were around, but they were so brutally rudimentary. You, I think the, like the, the resolution of those cameras, and they were very expensive, was something like abysmal, something like 192 by 200 pixels. So you take a picture, you could see kind of, almost like a mosaic. You could kind of see what you were looking at, but compared to now, yeah, it was, it was pretty bad. So yeah, I was in film, uh, I was into film photography, I had an old Canon, and uh, we'd have to shoot the film and you'd have to go into uh, the dark room and uh, you'd have to open the film canister, um, basically feed it into this little cage where you would put the um, development uh, solution. And then uh, you'd hope no light snuck in there at all. Uh, you'd do it in a dark room, of course. But sometimes it wouldn't have ruined your whole, you know, you'd have to go reshoot things sometimes because you'd ruin it. And then you'd have to take that, shoot that onto photographic paper in the dark room, and then put it through the washes to develop it. It's a lot of work and you could develop it and put too much or leave it too long in one solution. It would yellow the paper or you'd leave the um, projector that's projecting light on too long through the negative and it would burn everything in. I got to say it was really fun to do, but it is a huge pain, <clears throat> technical pain um, to just see a photo, right? And then to change it you'd have to dodge and burn with card and or leave the light on longer so digital photography is just it's so much better in my opinion to be able to shoot reshoot bracket things so get high exposures and low exposures to see which one is the best use uh something like photoshop but probably more like lightroom to tweak those photos right um but you learn a lot about exposure and, and uh, you know, value. I was shooting a lot of black and white, so yeah. Um, destroying the film. Um, I'm not sure if you mean the actual negatives or the paper. Um, with the paper, the paper's not sort of traditional paper because it has silver in it. And uh, so when it ex gets exposed to light, it, it interacts with it. But um, um, yeah, roll of film, no, I've never, never messed with that. Um, it was a very specific solution that you'd have to use, but you could, you can leave negatives in water and that kind of thing and, and mess with it. Um, I wasn't that interested in, in photography though to get to that kind of level of that fine level. Um, let's start a new layer here. Uh, all right. Let's, I'm going to zoom in on the face here on this guy. Zoom out on this guy a little bit. Let's get uh, she gonna switch models up. Let's do another couple, and then we'll kind of get into uh, pitching some ideas for what we can make. This 
is we don't really have a plan today. Um, part of the reason is it's good to kind of sit and brainstorm, right? Good to kind of think about things, troubleshoot things on the fly. I mean, a lot of what concept artists do is exactly that, right? It's sort of problem solve on the fly and uh, kind of imagine things, right? So we'll maybe get some ideas from you guys and incorporate the, uh, the viewers a little bit here. See what you guys got going on. Maybe I'll riff on some of those ideas. <clears throat> Ultimately, I'll decide. But maybe you guys can influence me a little bit more. Got some curls coming off the face. Beautiful curvilinear forms in there. The underside of the, the jaw. Kind of slowing down a little bit here, which is okay, right? Once you've got a, once you feel kind of warmed up, I mean, you could have sessions that that run for a really long time where you're just really going fast and and getting used to building um, building structures and whatnot. Um, without getting into crazy detail. I mean, if, if you hook up with a life drawing atelier, a lot of the times, you know, the certain days they'll do short poses for the whole session, or they might do really short poses to shorter, like, well, mildly longer, but for like two hours, just really quick. And then some are just gonna be like two hour sat poses. And you'll notice the model really has to be careful the pose that they choose, um, uh, or if there's some sort of director you know like if they get them to do a certain pose usually it's going to be laying down or sitting because again two hours you're not going to hold your arms up and point right for two hours because a you're going to start to bobble and lose your lose your kind of motor control because you're just going to get tired right so um if you ever want to become a model just worry, you got to worry about that so um no nah, but it's something you something that has to happen so you do get more of like uh, reclined poses and whatnot or people will lean on something and even then i've seen a lot of models just start to sag to the weight of gravity after a while um, as you can imagine the old minolta um yeah i mean it's funny how people like i i i grew up on a can and then when i got older i bought a, when digital cameras were a thing for a while uh, i realized i hadn't used my film camera because it was just egregious to go and get it printed and if it sucked i was like ah i don't want to spend the money doing that because i'm not full photography first um, but then I got a Nikon and I got really used to using my Nikon old D90 now. It's funny to say it's old, but it is definitely old now. Um, just with the controls and everything. And now I've got my, a Sony Alpha uh, A6400 and that's different again. So just sitting there training myself, um, can be a little bit of a, it's not a pain, but it's just time, right? It just takes time. So, um. Yeah. Uh, get that curl up. Did you ever make your own pinhole? Nope. Uh, old and modern film cameras, nice. Um, camera obscura. Uh, I have a Victorian World War One, and that's pretty cool. Um, I don't. No, I got. I think I got rid of my old canon it was starting to fall apart and i'm not gonna service an old camera i don't care about photography that much it's really good i mean photography is very good a now that people have cameras on their phones it's even easier to go and kind of start playing with framing um look at light collect reference texture reference lighting ref everything right um but uh 
yeah, no. No, I never did the screen printing or printing route. That was never my interest. Um, had some good friends in school do it, though. They really loved it. But that's sort of what you get in art school is you get people sort of breaking off into their specialties after they, they finish maybe the the foundation courses, right? Um, a lot of screen printers, though. I mean, you got to be careful with that stuff because I, I think a few of my screen printing or the screen printing teachers in my school have passed on from, from cancer because of some of those chemicals are super, super toxic. So you got to be, especially with uh, acid etch. Um, so it's just something to think about. I was never into it, but, you know, one of our teachers passed away from it. So it's just food for thought. I mean, maybe the the methods are better now people taking care of, of those chemicals but everybody always had these aprons these massive gloves and their uh eye eyewear their gas masks i'm like you must love screen printing because i am not wearing that stuff enough i i did some sculpting with uh soapstone and a dremel and uh, i loved it because it's like working with your hands it's very kind of like you can ruin it at any moment so it's very immediate but uh I also didn't really like wearing all the gear and having to have the tool on all the noise right if maybe if i i had my own space in the in the countryside that would be a little bit easier to kind of handle but uh, i'm certainly not going to do that in a condo apartment but uh yeah the, the gear is a thing right it's uh, enough even for this to for me to be wearing headphones and you know, I, I used to use a drawing glove on a Cintiq as well, but my hand, the older Cintiqs, like the newer Cintiqs actually have fans in them, so it keeps the surface cool. Um, I'm using a 21UX uh, as my 22 HD is in the shop, so to speak. Um, and even that, that's too hot for me, and it's just extra gear I gotta wear, and uh, I don't dig it. A lot of people use them though. Um, Did I do a life drawing session if I, where I use clay to sculpt? No, because that wouldn't be a life drawing session. <laughs> no, sculpture is in and of itself is definitely um, something where you'd want to you'd want to be practicing that stuff uh, quite a bit before you know demoing it. So uh, okay, so we've played with the with the warm up. Um, we're going to maybe look for a pose or something that we can use as reference and then kind of maybe get into uh, our own vibe. So I'm just going to pop in there. <clears throat> I have a picture of someone holding a sword. I won't go with that one. <clears throat> so we might go with uh, do a pose where we have a character sort of riding a horse or something like that. I got a I got a nice pose of of a character here. Um, where she's she's on an exercise ball um, you can kind of see that there um, and uh, I like that one well we'll maybe uh, we'll maybe start with that at least um, so start kind of roughing out the shapes there So something I'm going to do with this this sketch is I'm paying attention to the anatomy here, um, but I'm not going to be driven only by my reference. So um, you know I'm using it to know where the body parts are and and where some of those structures will be, but I can bend and move things however I want to create the shot that I want. Um, I can embellish certain body parts. I can kind of make it stylized if I want, or I can just make the, the proportions feel different um, if it suits me. 
Um, so, you know, that's more of the way I use anatomy as a concept artist anyway, is that I, um, I need it to enlighten me. I don't necessarily need it to translate exactly what I'm seeing. Now, you can absolutely do that. Um, and in a lot of cases, it's really good to do that. So you're, you're, you're creating kind of informed artwork, right? Um, but it's not always the case where, you know, I mean, in illustration, a lot of times it's good. You'll see certain illustrators build maquettes and take photographs and make sure that they're kind of just directly referencing things. And, and, uh, and that is great, right? But you sometimes want to be a little bit more free with, with the way things are working and uh, not, not use it as a crutch necessarily, right? Because again, you can get into drawing, you know, celebrities and that kind of thing. And, and you see this all the time on, you know, websites like Reddit, where Reddit, Reddit art or whatever. And uh, people are like, hey, I drew a picture of Morgan Freeman. And it looks like Morgan Freeman. And it's sort of like, great. Yeah, the verisimilitudes there. Um, you, you definitely kind of nailed that look of, of him. But like, what did you learn from it? Right. What, what is the takeaway other than, you know, photo photocopying? Because literally that's what it is. Uh, in, in some of these cases, it's people will copy a photo and uh, and you're learning. You're like, oh, OK, well, that color goes there. This shape is that shape. Those are really good things to start kind of observing. Right. But in terms of anatomy, for instance, you might be learning very little if you're not paying attention to why that that muscle or that 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 kind of protrusion or that volume looks the way it is what about the skeleton what about the muscle what about the fat the tissue on top that kind of thing right so um while practicing is good i mean even when you're thinking about master pack practice or master um mimicking master paintings it's like you want to engage in why the choices were made, what the shapes are, what the composition is, right? As well as trying to make it look, trying to translate that directly. Um, so paint with acrylic with a palette knife all the time. Um, a lot of my painting was uh, more uh, abstract as especially when you're for me oil paint was a lot more enticing because of the richness and the depth of of color sort of like it would be it's a little less opaque and more the light kind of bounces around within the oil of the oil paint so i like it a little bit better but i had lots of friends that were painting with acrylic and they make amazing paintings <clears throat> Yeah, things are going well. Currently working on a redesign of the cyborg I did for the intro to concept. Uh, nice. Good to hear you listen watch while I work. Ah, yeah, great. Glad to have you. The old cyborg. Uh, I the cyborg or the um, not maybe I'm not super clear on that. The uh, android, maybe right. Um, I wonder what will happen with life drawing sessions that are mandatory in art school when uh, we all start in the fall. Yeah, be interesting, right? You'll learn lots of uh, lots of fun sort of considerations and <clears throat> be able to look at things a little bit differently. Um, if you're actually in uh, a studio or, I mean, in a classroom, I'm not sure how it'll work in in the the covid days right because sometimes that uh i think now especially with brick and mortar schools are going to really struggle with uh with making that be meaningful right um if you can't if you can't show up there um but hopefully you can and you can have a live model and uh, you can start to see the benefits of actually sitting there with your own two eyes and this is something else. The model will shift slightly, right? You'll shift slightly. So you never get just this frozen moment in time. And so sometimes if her, say it's a female model, she'll have her arm up and the space in between her arm and her chest is a certain kind of shape. And then you look up again and it, she's kind of, because you know, she's getting tired, drops her arm a little bit. Now that shape's different. You're like, ah, oh, well, do I redraw it every time she moves? It's like, well, no, you have to start looking at the anatomy and going, okay, well, it was up here. I'm going to kind of continue that. 
I can't see as much as the armpit maybe and now I have to kind of think about that shape maybe you you think about it even after the life drawing session and learn about the muscles so the next time you can use memory for that to create that form right um, it's just really good practice all around so so at this point she's sitting on a ball and her hands are down on that ball, but I'm not quite sure what I want to do with with that. I think I'm going to kind of create this as like the rib cage of the horse. In the back there. Let's get this the well of this leg kind of moving back this way. underwear band in there just to see sort of where some of those masses are. And then sternocleidomastoids engaging on the neck real quick, roughing in the ear. Not sure what I want to do with her hair. Might be nice if it's kind of like maybe blowing in the wind, right? I might rough that out and get some some reference little bit might be nice to actually move her arm so she's holding uh, part of the saddle maybe that saddle part will kind of come out this way think about that horse that jaw that neck Maybe she's a cowboy, cow gal. Gonna get that mass in there. I'm just roughing in the horse right now because uh, I'm definitely gonna look at reference for um, what a horse looks like. Have that heel turn out just off frame there. Not too worried about that. So a lot of this loose mark making is uh, is nice because we don't have to commit necessarily to a lot of this stuff, right? Um, just kind of getting a sense of where the body center lines are, for instance, where some of the anatomy is in there. That's feeling pretty good. So this is a, <laughs> my students will, will know this, uh, you know, I talk about this being kind of like a rat's nest of sketch marks. Um, that's okay for you, right? You never want to submit something where you're the only person in the world that'll understand what the heck's going on, right? So let's make sure that you're being cognizant of that stuff. Um, Was your special? Uh, 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 was your specialty in school painting and fine art only? So I think you're talking about majors and minors, at least in our structure. Um, I majored in painting, uh, oil painting, specifically. Other people would ma major in, say, um, multimedia, so video, maybe. Um, sort of conceptual video, uh, some people in screen printing, some people in photography, 
right? So my whole class was a nice range. Some people were installation artists. Um, so yeah, my, my major was painting and uh, minored in drawing. Um, Tommy, who? Uh, going back to talk on master studies. Did you do a lot of them while you were learning? Did you think they are super helpful? Um, the master paintings I, I did in, in school. Yeah, we would study, I mean, even without drawing painting, we would, we would sit down and, and say theory classes and look at art, um, and study what they were doing, which is really good, right? I mean, it's, it's something that maybe a lot of people might kind of glaze over if you ta start talking about it, but, uh, where you're actually kind of learning from what it is you're, you're, you're seeing by just thinking about it, right? Like, what are they doing with light? What are they doing with um, value? What are they doing with the composition, with those things, right? Um, what kind of information are they projecting? Um, and, and how's that coming across? So, you know, some of the Renaissance stuff is maybe a little bit lost on modern day people because of, you know, all of the differences between then and now. Um, and then back then, there, there was a lot more kind of symbolism involved with, say, religion, that kind of thing. Um, and then those artists would be commissioned, right? They were professional artists. They wouldn't just be painting randomly. They would be commissioned by different, maybe, you know, rich people, royal people, that kind of thing to make, to make the artwork. Which is funny because uh, one of my art teachers told me uh, of situations where there would be somebody that's commissioned uh, an artist and then they don't pay them. So some of the artists would take it upon themselves to screw up their face or put them in funny poses and make fun of them, right? So like in big, big paintings, you could be, you could have multiple people commissioning you for them to be included in it. So sometimes you'll see the face just be covered by a, a veil or they'll be turning around or somebody will be just blocking them, right? which is a cheeky way of getting back at them. But uh, yeah, I mean, these artists were, were rock stars of their time um, because there wasn't any TV, right? There wasn't, there was, uh, there would have been theater in, in certain stages, that kind of thing. But art was, art was kind of one of the mainstay visual things. So sculpture and painting, drawing kind of thing. And then those people would have those beautiful pieces in their villas or their chateaus and whatnot, castles. And uh, so they could uh, show off to their friends. I mean, still to this day, you know, you'll see paintings be sold from, you know, tens to hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, so people can hang them up and impress their friends. <laughs> Or, I mean, they, they can definitely love the artwork, but I think it's definitely commodified by some people that don't love it. Um, what made you go, want to go from painting to digital concept art? Uh, well, I actually wanted to be a concept artist before I went to art school, but I knew I needed something a little bit more robust in terms of learning about how to do it than just high school art, right? Um, I, I think a lot of people can get by in the consumer art world by self-teaching. There's a limit, I think, to that. And you do start to see certain things happen to people that are self-taught now, like fan art is a big one. People will make fan art, they'll make it in a specific style, and that's all they do, right? And they have the capacity to do other things, but they may not have practiced how to brainstorm, how to actually conceive things, how to do all that work themselves. So. You know, you, you would go and look at somebody's uh, portfolio. I did a portfolio review in, uh, at GDC years and years ago for Activision. I was sat on their booth for them. And I had a huge lineup for, for art and concept art. And a lot of the portfolios I saw were sort of some of the students were in art school and theirs was a little bit better. Uh, some people were self-taught and it was just sort of like their favorite thing to do, right? Their favorite kind of art. And, and so, you know, that was not, you know, I had to crush a few spirits there and say that, you know, this stuff's not going to help you get hired. Um, 
and to kind of focus on some of the things that we talk about in the school, right? Uh, well, a lot of things we talk about in the school. So anyway, I'm meandering with the answer to that. Um, uh, it's, it, I just wanted to do concept art. I needed practice and I, I needed to know more about everything, right? Everything to do with art. So I found fine arts is really good in one way of kind of bringing an idea to fruition, learning about the history of art, that kind of thing. There wasn't a ton of commercial art programs around when I was going through uh, post-secondary education. Um, I would have probably gone for that instead of going through fine arts, but I found it super valuable. Uh, came out of fine arts though, and I really needed to spend a ton of time actually getting back to more commercial style work. Um, and it took me a while uh, to do that. I got turned down because my portfolios were too fine art based. Right? And then I eventually got to, uh, got the call so that was good but it took a lot of uh, me just learning on the fly and uh, I learned way more once I was in the industry so if I could do it all over again I and and there were these uh, classes available I would have would have taken something more commercial based or concept art based um, yeah I'm self-taught artist and started my trio today and feel already kind of overwhelmed mostly because I never used Photoshop before though uh, yeah I mean it, Photoshop I, once you kind of learn how the brushes work you know um, some of those basic tools I mean there's a lot of tools in here I don't engage with all the time right I, I do a lot of the drawing with the drawing tool of course um, you know your how to work your layers and then you know you can go from there there's a ton of stuff in Photoshop that you don't use, right? Uh, or don't need to use to make the artwork. And of course, Photoshop's not the only game in town. If you prefer other painting packages, I would just say, you know, focus on the ones that allow you to have file handle properly and don't kind of limit you to layers, that kind of thing. Um, most programs now are good for that. Say if you're only, if you have an iPad and you're only using I, uh, Procreate, Procreate limit has some limitations that, uh, you know, if you're going through, say, the concept art program, um, you, some of the things you might struggle with just because, the, you know, they have layer limitations. They have uh, a pretty broad range of, say, um, colorization techniques. But uh, overall, I, I feel like it's 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 built for the iPad, not not so much the, the desktop and, and sort of production ready stuff. But I've done artwork for clients on an iPad, <coughs> basic drawings. Um, a lot of sketching. I love that for sketching. So um, anyway, what I'm trying to point to is that uh, you can make it work for sure. And it just takes time to learn things, unfortunately. Um, <laughs> wouldn't it be nice if that wasn't the case? Um, all right. Let's get into drawing maybe some of the zoom in a bit in here. We're going to get a bit closer to our lady. And uh, I might grab a brush that's a little less crazy. Let's see. That one's crazy as well. Let's see what this one's like. Oh, that's kind of kind of beautiful. I still like the, the sort of like the bristles are spreading as you kind of stroke with it. That's, that's really nice. Are you learning are you learning in art school to do the matte painting by hand like the original Star Wars no no that that would be more of an illustration thing the fact that they're painting on glass and then the, the functions of moving that stuff back and forth um, you know that would be very much so illustrative commercial art rather than fine art right because it's fine arts sub you know about the individual about the esoteric sort of expression of self um idiosyncratic um expression that kind of thing um not so much trying to make something production ready right so people will buy the artist's work in in fine arts and people employ a commercial artist to make their visualizations in commercial art so it's it's quite different 
Let's get a bit closer to her here. We got some cool texture in there. The nice thing about this is like, I got lots of lines to select from. I'm gonna start a new layer. And uh, let's make my brush a little bit smaller. I do want to test my resolution and you guys should all get used to that. If you feel like it's too small, now's the time to amp it up, right? So image, image size, we're at 5,000 by 5,000 pixels. We can maybe amp that to seven. And my resolution's at 300, so that's print quality. Um, it's gonna make this file super heavy, but my computer can handle it. If you can't, you know, do your best. And we'll let it uh, resample everything. We'll have a sip of water. Oh, but the, uh, the matte painting is pretty cool, right? Seeing those guys, painstaking detail. It's, it's a ton of practice to, to get that kind of bang on. But very impressive once it happens. Um, anything where people are, are creating realistic looking things that aren't, you know. I mean, even say Robert Bateman paintings of animals are interesting. Um, because there's a lot of artistic license going on in there. And then he's, he's looked at raw, uh, Ross, moss, rocks, mud, trees, everything. Right. So he's got a good sense of that stuff. He'll probably all, also go and grab reference of those things, all of the things that we can do. Um, but then he might mold them to his will. Um, okay. So I'm just going to zoom in a little bit more on my model and, uh, just to kind of. I'm still going to be a little bit sketchy here because I don't I don't want this to be something where, you know, I'm I'm trying to nail it perfectly because I still might want to make some changes in there. This brush is is nice and soft, so so we can uh, allow for that to to happen in there. Little brow ridge. So some feedback that I've given recently about kind of the face um, when when certain uh, students are drawing it. Um, a lot of the times the the idea can be that people think of okay well I got the volume and now I map an eye onto it and they don't think about the fact that there's an ocular cavity a hole in your skull that has the muscles uh the eyeball itself right and and you know all the forms and so we'll get something that starts to look like a a flat sort of map of something on top of a a, a flat surface right and so that can look kind of hilarious right when it's when it's just there's there's no there's no volume to it it's just kind of this this flat map thing on top but once you start kind of adding sort of um you know maybe there's bags under the eyes or that there's an actual kind of cornea on the eyeball and and that kind of thing eyelids um you know folds on skin that kind of thing you can start to get something that looks a little bit more believable right Draw a goofy little happy face there. Um, uh, when you create characters like this for fun, do you mentally create a backstory or just go with the flow? Um, it's good. I think it's always good to actually have a little bit of a narrative in mind because... Um, it may manifest that narrative or elements of that narrative may manifest or, or would improve the, the character if they manifest in some of the choices of, of your character in here, right? So uh, this character, you know, she's gonna be of, of African descent, right? Um, I'm thinking cow, cowgirl, right? So. You know, like what choices would she make for costume design? What choices would she make for kind of the way, um, 
you know, she styles her hair, if she's wearing any sort of makeup or anything like that, like what would she, what would she put on? What would she use, right? And, and so, um, because uh, let's think of it the other way. If we don't think of those things and we just fill them in, it seems like that's just arbitrary. We're leaving money on the table, right? So, you know, if, if say it made sense for her to have her hair pinned back, you know, sort of in, in like a, a bun, and uh, because she does a lot of active things and she doesn't want her hair flowing around, right? Then that might be a thing for you. Um, and then you make that visual choice. Um, so yeah, I mean, if you're in, in going through the school, a lot of uh, what we do teach you is sort of having forethought with these things. So it's not just random stuff because it can look it can end up looking like that when when somebody say sees your portfolio um and it doesn't look like there's any rhyme or reason or you can't get to any sort of projected storyline be it a vague one or a very detailed one um it's gonna look like the the designer doesn't have much of a sense of design they're just making art at that point which is nice you can get away with a lot of that stuff but um it's i find it's always better to to have some sort of sense of uh of what you want, right? Because then you can put that in the artwork. So. <clears throat> That's a good question though, very good question. I missed start drawing, uh, been drawing motorbikes for class this Friday with Eric, ooh, fun. Um, <clears throat> yeah, motorbikes, uh, I'm actually going to have that move up underneath her here. Uh, hard surface, anything really, right? Um, a question was asked earlier, uh, you know, like, do you draw environments when you're, you're getting into, um, Say so sorry, do you draw environments or, or practice environments like we're doing here with models? Uh, if you're gonna be doing an environment piece, then yeah, I mean, if you're gonna be doing hard surface stuff, like think a mech, like we don't have mechs wandering around among us for the most part. I know that there was a couple of mechs built and they had a battle and whatever, but not maybe Gundam style or whatever, whatever else you're thinking, mech warrior, blah, 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 Titanfall. So, um, so what would you do then? I mean, get familiar with different machines that have motors and say a motorbike's really nice because there's a lot of aesthetics that go into the fairing on a motorbike, uh, whether it's choppers or, um, uh, you know, something like a, a ninja or like, you know, road bikes of any sort, you can start to look at kind of different qualities of it. It's like, so if you get an old school chopper, that's uh, been built by somebody and it's maybe a bit more rustic and, and the tank is a bit rusty and that's their aesthetic, you know, that's going to look a lot different than something that rolled off the line like an Aprilo or a, um, a, what am I trying to say? Ducati, right? Uh, more Ninja. It's, it's like those things are, they're, they're quite different aesthetics and you can get like cafe racers that are going to be a different aesthetic than that as well so just kind of gathering that stuff not that you're going to make a motorbike but you can kind of see where a gas tank meets uh solid metal strut with with you know suspension or or kind of um cooling fins on on the engine block right like i could take some of that i could morph it and put it on the back of my mech right and so um you know, I'm kind of using that reference to build a visual library up here uh, to be drawing on, to be able to to kind of warp to my heart's content. Um, so, yeah, I, you know, that's awesome that you're doing that. You definitely want to kind of keep that up. I wonder if I want to put like a hat on her. I'm thinking about the hat. One of the things that I want to do first is actually think about the hat fitting on her head. Go figure, right? Um, and then the, the, the rim of the hat, you know, if it's tilted outward, what does that ellipse shape look like? And uh, 
you know, I draw through quite a bit. In the sketch phase, this will keep you from getting too sentimental. All right, so maybe her hat's sitting quite far off of her head. Maybe that means that her hair is going to have to be a little bit tighter to her head, at least where it the hat sits. You know, maybe she, does she have a feather sticking off of it at the front? Mm, maybe off the side. She's got multiple feathers. It's sort of sat up on top of her head, right? So maybe that's what she likes. Could be that her hair kind of moves down the back of her head. She might have some sort of interesting massing. Maybe she's even got a net on, on her hair back there that's ornate. That could be pretty cool. Keep it all together, but maybe when she lets her hair down, it's kind of big, flowing, beautiful. Not that short hair isn't beautiful. Um, but that could be cool. Um, maybe she's an outlaw, though. I don't know. Or maybe she's just sort of like... She does what she wants. Maybe she's a, a sheriff. Or a bounty hunter. That'd be pretty cool. She might have got into some fights. Uh... You know, I always uh, laugh at a friend of mine um, about scars. Um, you know, sometimes they're ever present <laughs> on any character. Nice thing about them is that they're, you can use them for contour. You know, on her, it might be pretty cool to have, uh, maybe she was attacked by a cougar. And she has, maybe that's part of her story, right? She survived and killed a cougar she's that hardcore kind of affecting uh, affecting her beauty a little bit in terms of it not being kind of this perfect span of skin so maybe she doesn't feel so precious at that point right um that could be pretty cool in terms of where have to think about kind of what we want what we'd want on her I might kind of eh. I might extend her body the drawing in the background down a little bit I kind of want a longer torso than what I have so I'll just grab everybody and then just draw them down a little bit more I can come back up here and Kind of get some of those lines in. <clears throat> I'm thinking about pecs. She's going to have a bit of pectoral kind of coming through there. I'd like that idea. And this is something when you're doing character design, you know, like you want your character to seem like their abilities are there. Not that just like is someone's a, a, con a stone cold killer and they don't look like they can even open a door by themselves. Right. So it's not bad to get maybe some muscle tone on a character that uh, that you want to feel like is, is a bit more hardcore in there. So I might give just the tiniest striations. It might not be something I see yet. Because if I start putting kind of these massive pectorals on her, she might start to look too much like a bodybuilder. Some of that may have to happen down the line when I'm sort of uh, maybe putting in some subtle lighting, right? That might just, just reveal a little bit of striation in the pectoral. Um... Got to do 10 sketches of machinery, 10. Yep. Or you could do 20. Do the advanced stuff. Um, get some more experience in it. Um, it's all good, right? But 10's, 10's a good start. Yeah, and, and that's just really meant, I mean, in that part of the course, just to get you in a good headspace with making sure you're practicing. So good, good stuff. Um, 
or her fingernails are too sharp. Um, I mean, that might be pretty cool. It might be part of her, her vibe or she might just have one hand or like when she goes for her gun, she might have sort of like, uh, her trigger finger might be, you know, n sort of shorter nails, but she might have a couple fingers that have like sort of these spikes on them. Right. Um, that she slashes people with that's her, that's her thing. She marks her bounties. Um, maybe she's searching for somebody that killed her parents or something like that, right? Or did her wrong at some point in life. Um, that's why she's a bounty hunter. Um, yeah, that could be cool. I don't even have sharp nails and manage to scratch my face. Yeah, I've done that. I actually, you know, reach for something and just like carve my face up. Yeah. Do you ever have mountain lions coming into the city in Canada where you're at? Uh, cougars? Not into Vancouver. Um, we get bears. So the odds, it's it's sort of newsworthy if a bear makes it into downtown because it's it's very far of, to the edge of the forest. But we've got coyotes in the bigger parks here, raccoons, um, skunks, the standard standard animal fare here um but cougars are very elusive um in fact the only two cougars i've ever seen in the wild have been hit by cars on the highway um otherwise they 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 tend to not be seen if it, if they're stalking you you wouldn't really know um for the most part sometimes i think there's videos online of a guy hearing this cougar and then he got pictures of him walking and the cougars walking down the path behind him and the the lights flashing off of the cougar's eyes look super creepy but yeah those things can like leap 40 feet or something crazy like that whatever that is in meters um they're they're pretty cool pretty cool animals but no we don't get them much uh here last cougar attack was on uh there's a big island off the coast of the west coast of canada called vancouver island and uh, some campers, I think somebody got killed by one out there. Um, I think more bears. Bears are the thing to worry about. Not so much uh, black bears, but like browns and grizzlies. Polar bears in the northern parts of Canada are a thing. Um, I don't know if it's real, but I, I read that and there's a place in Canada called Churchill where you can go and look at the northern lights and, and go on tours to look at you know wildlife in the north like polar bears and apparently it's a thing where you leave your cars unlocked in case somebody gets attacked by a polar bear they can hop in your car who knows if that's real but that sounds like something that would be uh, functional for people So if I'm going to kind of re-envision where this arm is going, I'm kind of thinking about that mass moving forward more, right? So I'm, I'm thinking about the contour of that. And then, uh, you know, if the, the saddle comes up in front here, that she might be laying her hand on top of that. So I'd have to kind of think about her hand wrapping around that maybe you know, with the, the thumb coming off, or maybe the thumb would be wrapping around. And then I might have to adjust the arm a little bit there to make sure that that would feel good. And I'm just roughing those forms out for now. This arm's going to roll back a little bit. If she's got a gun. Definitely going to be looking at reference for old school repeaters. Single action. Might be nice that she doesn't have like a, she might have a, a 1911 or something that's uh, not just a single action. Um, monitor litter, lizard snakes, the worst be Komodo. Oh, where are you at? Are you getting a Komodo dragon? That's crazy. Yeah, Canada can be, I mean, depends. I mean, some of our Australian students could probably speak to 
more danger in more places than Canada. I mean, you're pretty safe here because um, mostly bears are afraid of you and cougars are pretty afraid of people. It's like very random that you get attacked. Um, anyway. Polar bears and grizz started mating. Huh, I didn't know that. That is crazy. Crazy. All right, let's kind of move down character a little bit here. And make her a little bit more muscular looking. So something that you want to watch out for when doing this kind of thing is I'm going to run into a little bit of an issue here and potentially, and what that might be is a bit of a tangent, right? So when, when one form maybe sweeps into another form and they make contact or are very close to making contact, what can happen is the, the viewer is kind of left unaware of which sits on top of what, especially it's a 2d format, right? There's no way of like moving your head to see where that form sits. So you're kind of locked in looking at it the way you're looking at it. So um, I'd be careful about that. What I'm kind of planning is that the gun holster might sit right here and I'm gonna get more of a, uh, uh, an obvious overlap on that, uh, that volume, whatever it is, right? That in there, so so just be, be aware of that. So I think she's, I'm gonna give her kind of low rise cowboy pants, maybe kind of lace up. I would go a little bit higher even, right? Just above the obliques, a little bit there, and maybe the lace-up kind of moves down that way. Then she could actually have a pretty cool belt buckle up high. In terms of the upper portion of her, I kind of want her arms to be exposed and a little bit of the kind of muscularity on her pectorals. Um, so I kind of want, maybe like we're thinking about something in here and, and so that might be like a, a short kind of vest or something. That could be pretty cool. Um, let's kind of run with that idea at the very least in here. Maybe we think about it being buttoned up. Something in there. We'll keep it rough for now. Uh, I don't want to spend too much time on that before I'd have a chance to look at reference. Um, but I, I like the idea of that being kind of maybe something uh, exposed like that. She could even have, um, maybe she rides with a jacket kind of off her shoulders. That could be pretty, pretty badass. In there. something like that cool if you're gonna go off on a tangent so to speak with different design ideas what I would suggest is put on a different layer just so that you don't blow up your original drawing um, no, maybe she has tattoos people would like tattoos nowadays wouldn't they and so what I'm doing I'm not giving specific tattoos I'm kind of just drawing lines on here to indicate what that might look like for her so you'll see this in like modern representations of period pieces where it's sort of they modernize it, and it it's not accurate to the way things were but seems maybe a little bit more marketable to modern audiences right so you know i think we've all seen that um 
if you were say if your client was really gunning for realistic representations you don't want to do that right Cause it's not going to make sense but maybe she was like uh maybe she came from background of uh sailing um and she got sailor tattoos kind of like the sticker book blotches everywhere right it's very kind of uh very sought after nowadays that kind of thing we could give her like some killer legs as well like some really kind of muscular muscular legs might be nice sort of like athletic though right um sort of jeans form-fitting jeans to get the seam down the side here sort of like those uh, equestrian pants I'm thinking about and then the the boot could be really high up on her in there right so something something like that and she might have kind of these buckles that run down the side that loop through Right, something like so. I feel like this thumb would be further out. She's got two two thumbs. Let's get rid of that one. Riding gloves, definitely. It could be that she has sort of like these hardcore leather gloves over top of more of like a lacy glove underneath. Kind of keep some of the femininity in there, right? But also make it look a little bit more rough. That could be pretty cool. Does she have a necklace? I wonder, right? Do we want to cover up like if I'm spending a lot of time and effort making the pectorals kind of uh, a bit of her kind of key part of her design, I might not want to add stuff in the way. Right. So again, there's an example of me thinking about it, not just doing it because I like the idea in the moment. It may not serve my my piece by the end. All right. I think I got to move that out a little bit. There's still uh, oh, we'll go up there. Hybrid bears, so what color would you be? Light brown. <laughs> that would be interesting. I'm gonna have to Google that. Um I'll do that. Grizzly polar bear hybrid. Uh it's called a Pizzly, I guess. Northwest Territories, okay. Interesting. Still pretty white, but a little bit brown. Strange. Result of climate change. That makes sense. Um, crazy. You want a raccoon dog as a pet? <laughs> uh, a guy on YouTube has a pet cougar, sleeps in the bed with him. I have not. I am Puma. I always think that that's just begging for for disaster. Wild animals like that. Um, with this, I know the, the saddle's sitting a little bit too far backward, so I'm just going to rough that in. That's going to be something that I need to know about, right? Um, I don't draw saddles all the time, uh, so that'll be maybe something I got to gotta work on uh, for her. Maybe her, she's got bed roll back here. Saddlebags. Uh, 
I would like the access to be there. Um, she might have a gun, like a long, long rifle right next to her that she can pull. Um, maybe on top of that, she might have like a machete or an ax. Play with that later, but maybe something like that that moves that way. I want to make her feel hardcore. So we'll just rough those shapes in. Um, the horse neck, those big, big, strong necks. go back to our model so that other leg is kind of just disappearing over and behind on that side which seems legitimate okay I do kind of like this flow this thing flowing off of her maybe she just does have long hair not not kind of bound up She just lets her locks fly and get some interesting kind of shapes that look like the hair is being whipped in the wind. Does she have like a hardcore earring? Skull switchblade. Almost like a something you'd see in a music video. This hat's maybe been busted up. This character I can make in Red Dead. <laughs> I'm I, I saw this this cartoon about character creation somewhere and doing a bad job of translating it but it was either you make the most beautiful character idealized form or you make the most hideous character i love making the most hideous characters with character creators same went for black desert uh, if you've ever played that black desert online um i i'm tr i tried to make the most ugly characters i could because i was just having fun with it the only reason i bought that game was for the character creator <laughs> I'm the worst with that kind of thing I wonder if she she might have one of those long styling cigarette holders all right maybe that kind of flows in behind her because she's from the Wild West Things are a bit rougher back then. They do unhealthy things like smoke, but she doesn't care. Get that belly button in there. So sort of midriff. We could give her like more kind of distinct abs to give her that extra kind of vibe of being super fit, right? Which might be nice for her, so she looks the part, right? Like I was saying before, we don't want it to end up being something where she's like, um, you know, confused, confusing looking. That's something that I, I think I mentioned this before, but something that I really enjoyed about some of the, I guess you could call it reboot of um, the first Tomb Raider, where um, sort of the more modern one uh, video game. And she was, when she encountered males because of her stature versus their stature, she didn't just overpower them, right? She had to use her wits to, to kind of, get out of situations where she was being overpowered so that makes her more believable to me right and you i kind of the suspension of disbelief stays engaged with something like that where you know you have say a cartoon character where this big muscly guy comes in and you go to smash somebody and this little person holds their hand up and they're not like maybe um 
they don't have superpowers they're just normal it's just sort of hard for me to make that mental leap when you know it's obviously that person's gonna overpower them right so that's what we'd want to do in here i think is kind of just get her feeling um feeling good in terms of that gonna get some of these folds in the the leg happen a little bit further back I'm so that's something else here is I'm basing this off of a model that is uh, for the most part nude um, and so you gotta have some space for the actual fabric to bind and that kind of thing you can't just be thoughtless about that translation right so think about it when you get into those 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 areas okay and pretty cool I mean maybe there's sort of like an interesting sort of lace pattern on the top of that it could be like uh leather so a little bit kind of more rough or or i guess it would stand up to um damage a little bit better um and then that could even be kind of in, embossed with designs which might be really cool especially if we're limiting it to a certain area of the body right um i may want to leave it less um noisy with detail if she's got a ton of tattoos say right like, i want to have areas of rest not have everything just like screaming at me like look all the same cold in density of detail everywhere so food for thought i like the uh, the tattoo idea a little bit better like even kind of like a neck tattoo that could be really cool um Begging for disasters at second channel. <laughs> um, I have a werewolf, werewolf cat as a pet. I don't know what that means. Um, did you ever have a pet, fox or chinchilla? No. Uh, dogs, cats are fine. I uh, bought paper and pencils today so I can sketch on field. So I can sketch on field too. A bit slow in Photoshop at the moment. You know, just regular sketching is great, right? Getting that hand-eye coordination is fantastic. You don't need power. It never runs out of batteries. You just have to sharpen that thing, right? And then buy a new sketchbook when it's full. Um, if you're struggling with Photoshop, don't let the fact that it's hard keep you from getting better at it. I get this a lot from students. It's like, oh, I'm not very good in, in Photoshop, so I'm going to sketch in my sketchbook instead, and then I'll submit those as sketches. It's better that you crash and burn now, learn about it, ask questions, get involved, get used to it. Get that out of the way, right? Um, still sketch, right? That's still great to do. In fact, it's really good to do. But don't let that be a, a, a crutch for why you're not getting into Photoshop and getting better at it. Because it just takes time to get past that ugly, awkward, frustrating uh, section. Um, Yeah, silhouettes. Yeah, just think about the basic shapes. Don't get into the details. Just what are the biggest shapes on that wire? Uh, like, is that different than this? Make them all different and play with different proportions of shapes, right, overall. Um, and leave the detail out in, in your thumbs for now. Uh, every Marvel character ever? Yeah, I assume you're talking about the uh, unbelievable shenanigans i mean they're sub they're generally they have their mutants or they have su superpowers um and uh and so I, I i you know that's a little bit more believable if i've got to suspend disbelief for it um let's see five foot seven character travels some soldiers is a bit jarring at times yeah it is i mean it is unless it unless there's a reason right like spider-man's great because they've incorporated the super strength right he's got he's got the agility of of a spider he's got the strength of a spider or spider webs whatever they're associating there and uh and so yeah you can get on board with that i mean it's always it's always difficult for me in superhero films and, and movies uh comic books even where everybody has a solution eventually to the bad guy 
right and as, as soon as you have multiple of these films flying out there you kind of get like oh bad guy's gonna win this time no he's not no she's not it's like the the good guys are always gonna win so you know cut and paste your favorite character and favorite villain on top of that storyline for me it just gets a little bit uh dog-eared um after however many films right like what's the struggle i mean the most interesting thing in the mcu in in the late period has been the internal struggle between the, the superheroes rather than the villains because the villains just want to wreck stuff and uh yeah anyway I don't know. I, I I get kind of fatigued with with all the MCU stuff. The effects and all of the bright and shiny baubles in those films is all fun, but uh, I, I personally could only take so much of that before getting tired of it. Um, oh, where werewolf? <laughs> I think I might have seen one. I worked in uh, animal shelter as a volunteer for a while and there's one cat that was super scary looking um for me makes the, the boys yeah the boys is fun uh, i haven't finished watching that uh but that was fun definitely fun because it, it actually looks at that as being kind of like how do they deal with it um <laughs> yeah uh yeah the bad pizza is still pizza yeah i mean that's just it sometimes you just want something fun mindless you just want to go and eat pizza right bad pizza is well i've had bad pizza and sometimes i've thrown it out so there's also that maybe you, you haven't had bad enough pizza yet um i should get that type of cat i'll look into it right the werewolf cat um cool all right well we're we're kind of <clears throat> time's flown by here and we're getting but we got kind of a, a good stab at our character going on um so far uh there's some really sketchy lines still but we started to home in on maybe what we wanted her to look like um and see sort of like how she's forming up uh so i'm pretty happy with that actually as as we we're moving forward um with that so we might pick this up uh next week just to we'll warm up again and uh, we'll get in here and maybe start doing more of uh, some some more kind of uh, illustrative rendering uh, so we can look at those forms, see what the body forms of not only her, the horse, right? Even we'll look at saddles and guns. We'll get some reference going and uh, we can we can see how we progress on that. But otherwise, you know, there you go again. You know, this is going to be a, uh, a fairly common thing on Mondays where we're going to kind of warm up and then build something out of that just so that it can help all of you maybe with the motivation to do it, right? So that it's not just mind-numbing practice. It's, it can be for something, right? So uh, that'll be it for me for today. I got to run, but uh, thanks, everybody. Um, fun to have you guys around. Uh, but uh, I do recommend getting in there and playing with this stuff, right? So um, follow along if you haven't, or next week, join in. And uh, we'll jam. Otherwise, have a great week, everybody, and uh, we will we will see everybody maybe at the concept stream on Thursday. We'll see see some of you back maybe. Take care. See you guys next time.